All right, here we are in Chapter 2, looking at history, culture, and Canadian families. And we're going to look at some basic definitions, race, ethnicity, uh, visible minorities. We're also going to look at some of the history of some of the family components as it relates to our history of Canadian uh, history in terms of uh, Aboriginals, English Canadian, and Quebecois Canadians. And then we'll also look at some of the patterns of immigration and what are some of the criteria and some expectations about how that plays out. And all of this, of course, affects family, because, of course, family isn't just one dynamic, as we learned in Chapter 1. It's multiple faceted in a way, and it's multiple definitions. So our multiculturalness of Canada affects family form, and this chapter will focus on those elements. Okay? So we'll move right along, and we'll carry into this chapter looking at uh, race and ethnicity. Okay, as you can see there, we've got two definitions, one of race and one of ethnicity. Where you're looking at race, you're looking at physical characteristics different, such as skin color. Whereas ethnicity, you're looking at cultural heritage, where you're from, where you've been raised, and in different parts of geography. Now, while cultures appear to be more real than races, classification by ethnicity is also a complex undertaking, especially in a multicultural society like Canada. And um, when we interpret the information coming from the data of the um, census, ethnicity is getting more challenging because, one, the concept of, of ethnicity is fairly fluid. It's changing um, over time. And respondents to the census, uh, their understanding of their own ethnicity and you know their generational cohort, the length of time since immigration, and the social context at the time in which the data was collected is all making this more and more difficult um, to distinguish ethnicity from um, groups of people. You couple that with an increase intermarriages among people, uh, which is creating multiple ancestries, um, different variations, if you will, of us all together. And then you add to that changes in the format in which census questions are being asked. All contribute to this difficultness, if you will, of distinguishing ethnicity, especially in a multicultural co country like Canada. Uh, for example, uh, the inclusion of Canadian as an ethnic choice in the census has led to an increase uh, selection as Canadian as a category and as a choice for people to distinguish themselves. And so this has been and is not as straightforward as one might just think. Now we're going to move, move in slightly here to visible minority. As you can see by what I've got there, in 1996, that was the census that was done then, and it was the first time that people were ever really asked about uh, what member of what group uh, they were a part of, of some visible minority. So it was the first time we were gathering that kind of information. And just as we saw in chapter one, and we looked at the definition of family, and we had a variety of different definitions for it, and we find that with different groups, people have also got different definitions about how we describe different visible minorities. The legal definition, their social definitions, and individuals may have their own definitions, and the same is true with the ethnicity and race. So we have to get past our own definitions and into the real definition and see how that affects things. Minority groups refer to any group uh, where they hold less power than the dominant group. And the dominant group doesn't necessarily have more numbers. A uh, minority group may have more numbers, but they have less power, less authority over themselves, if you will. Okay. So when we look at the Canadian population, we can consider some major groups that have had a, a very big impact and very good starting point in terms of the Canadian families. Aboriginals, which includes the term Aboriginal, includes uh, those people who are self-identified as First Nations, uh, Inuit, or Métis. And their families are generally consisting of parents and their children, as well as inclusive, often, of a, an extended family network. And from the first Aboriginal people who arrived thousands of years ago in the area, it's now, that is now known as Canada, have been uh, populated in waves of um, additional immigrants. And the social structure and cultural norms and values in Canada about families and other elements and Canadian society have changed with each passing wave. 
Now, what's interesting about the Aboriginal population is that it's been growing nearly six times faster than any other Canadian population as a whole, especially the Métis, and that the Aboriginal um, population is made up of a much younger population for the most part, which are putting more people in a more childbearing um, age. Now, also what we find is more people are identifying as Aboriginal, as having Aboriginal connections, and when you think of the number of Aboriginal folks that live on residences, those numbers are more accurately kept as far as uh, census is concerned. Now, the other components of Canadian culture in terms of history would include the English and French Canadians, where for the most part, the Canadian English society has roots in Britain, as you would, have, uh, you would already be self-aware. And the essential component about this was the character of the English Canadian um, was to be more based on the British Empire, which um, was focused on colonization and conquest at the time. And so the early English immigrants, um, uh, they had a chief, the, you know, the sort of chief area of family that was most important to them was this element of nuclear family. That was a very British component. And they were less supportive of the cooperation that would have been useful and helpful for uh, many other practicing individuals in Canada, including uh, Catholics in Quebec and uh, Aboriginals. And so it was a pretty um, closed, if you will, component of Canadian society at that time. Whereas in Quebec, uh, although it's not a British background, it has more of a French background and uh, very much was guided in the early years in the early part of Quebec's background in history by the Roman Catholic Church. And it defined all about family and educational goals. And so it was a very church dictated uh, province at the time. In fact, of course, it wasn't a province at the time. It was um, earlier than the Confederation. And then um, along with this sort of focus of family and educational goals by the Roman Catholic Church was rural lifestyle, which was really important, large families, which was um, ideal for uh, families, and the underpinning about the French language and culture. And it's only the importance of the French language that seems to remain unchanged, uh, but it is made only um, made central only in Quebec society rather than to French Canadian culture as a whole. That is to say that the province of Quebec focuses a lot on the importance of language, whereas French Canadians that live in the East Coast or the West Coast don't seem to um, get the same level of um, uh, initiative in that area about language culture. From about 1960 on, the authority of the Roman Catholic Church over the province uh, was replaced by education as having its own focus, by an industrial economy replacing this sort of rural focus, and that large families were sort of curtailed and um, altered because of the sexual revolution and contraceptive advances. So the province of um, the, pro the provincial government of, of, of Quebec. Um, then later took over uh, social services and the Quebec, Quebec Family Support Program has become some of the strongest in Canada. And so, so in, t in terms of family, it, 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 the province in, in, in um, uh, Quebec seems to focus on the family quite a bit differently and more um, profoundly than it does in the rest of Canada. When we look at other immigrant groups, um, Canada is very diverse. Um, over 200 ethnic groups uh, as of the 2006 census. By 2031, about 25% of Canadian citizens will be foreign born. About half will be from Asia, and about 30% will, be, uh, will belong to a visible minority group, nearly double the population reported in 2006. Now, this visible minority group will largely be um, living in cities, in particular um, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, where up to 63% of Toronto will have has visible minorities, 59% of Montreal, and 31% of Vancouver. Canada is a very heterogeneous population. Nearly half of those uh, 15 and older will be foreign-born or have at least one foreign-born parent in Canada. And so we are more and more diverse, we are more and more um, um, multicultural um, as the years go on. 
And of course, this is going to have an impact on family dynamics in terms of what does a family look like? Um, who, who gets included in family? Family definitions will be affected by this. And so we have the um, an example here of the, the Canadian populations and people, this is from the census, um, where we look at uh, the total number of responses of people who said they were Canadian, English, French, Scottish, Irish, German, Italian, Chinese, North American, Aboriginal, Ukrainian, Dutch, Polish, East Indian, and Russian. And the number of single response, that's someone who would say, I am Canadian, that's the only response they made on the census, and multiple responses where these were people who would say, I am both Canadian and French, or I am Canadian and German, and we see that there's a vast number, a huge number. Um, the effect on families in terms of mixed race families, it varies quite a bit in that uh, we see more examples of mixed race people marrying. Um, marriage and common law unions between visible and, and non-visible minority individuals, children born of such parents, children adopted internationally and interracially within Canada, mixed race couples experiencing difficulties arising from different cultural traditions and from the prejudice of relatives. It's been, it's really affected family on a number of different levels, both positively and negatively, but some of those negatives are really just growth spurts and adjustments that take time to um, find their way. So when we look at patterns of immigration, we've had a history of immigration in Canada from almost the day in which Canada became a country. Um, from the pre-1900s, um, most of our immigrants, if you will, came from Britain and the United States. And that's that immigration population, or waves, if you will, have changed over the years. Uh, we've got um, federal and provincial governments deter, um, that at one point, deterred the immigration of non-whites. Now, in our early years, it was Chinese and, and Japanese that were affected this way, as well as other groups. Um, Many groups also admitted to, uh, to Canada for humanitarian reasons. So when you look back over, over history, um, it's impossible to talk about immigrants as a single group. There's been many factors that affected who have uh, who've been allowed to immigrate and where and how many could come in a particular period. And um, this has changed over time as well. Over the last century, key factors that have in, uh, included the desire to maintain a British character in Canada, that was part of the motivation towards, you know, some people being allowed to immigrate and others not. The need for labor to develop the country, that brought a lot of different groups in, and so um, they would have also different access to rights and responsibilities in Canada in the early years. Um, the humanitarian reasons could be wide and varied. Fugitive slaves who escaped from the U.S. to Canada. Um, this was back in the 1700s, and we've had many examples of humanitarian um, immigrants in the past. Here what you're seeing are who was, um, what were the immigrants' country of origins from 19... 81 and how that's changed to um, uh, 2011. Um, the three quarters of immigrants, uh, now nearly three quarters of the immigrants come from Africa and Asia, Caribbean, Latin America, and only 16% for Europe. Currently, the largest group of residents of immigrant, uh, recent immigrants, come from Chinese, uh, ch are Chinese and South Asians with the largest visible minority. So we are changing population and we will continue to be a changing population. So when we think about the experience of immigrants coming to Canada, it's wide and varied. Many immigrants see Canada as the promised land. Um, types of policies in place at time of arrival either facilitate or complicate this adaptation and there's been a lot of troubles with immigration, both in terms of the means of which we support immigrants coming into Canada both in regards to finding employment and finding residence. Um, the official policy on multiculturalism is promoted through public recognition and through funding of ethnic diversity. What you're seeing on the screen there is the Citizen Citizenship and Immigration Canada website. And actually, this is in particular um, the study guide for new immigrants. And 
when we think about new immigrants, there's a lot of different variabilities that they experience. Now, despite generally being more highly educated and skilled, new immigrants have difficulty finding work. Part of it is on qualification similar, excuse me, similarities from the country of their origin to Canada. It's also a lack of Canadian experience. Now, part of that is, for example, um, how you do business in Canada is different than how you do business, say, in Asia. And one of the things that's strong about finding work and, and, and doing business in Canada is this element of smooching or networking. And if you come to Canada without those sort of being prepared and knowing how to network and interact with people, then it becomes difficult to find some jobs. It's oftentimes who you know, not necessarily what you know. They also have problems with uh, having the appropriate qualifications or having their qualifications recognized. And then the other is around the fluency of English or French. Um, many come in with more than one language, English being their second or even third language, and fluency in that language is a difficult thing. So when we look at when they do find work, what we notice is um, what you're seeing here is a graph of immigrants uh, landed in the previous in, in within previous five years. That's the gold color. The blue is the total landed immigrant number, and then Canadian born is the green. And you're seeing the average hourly wage distribution uh, for different age groups. So on average, the incomes are lower for immigrants than for Canadian born uh, workers. In 2008, the average hourly wage for a working age Canadian born employee was $23.72, uh, while the average hourly wage for a Canadian immigrant was $21.44, a gap of $2.28. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, and in some respects it maybe, it maybe is not, but over the long haul, you know, year in and year out, that's a significant reduction in what you would take home and how that would affect what you could afford to do. Now, these are professional wages. This isn't necessarily uh, wages for just anybody coming from another country doing any kind of job. Uh, the disadvantage both in finding work and in the level of income may continue for many years to come, it's expected. Now, the experience of immigrants in Canada, well, upon arrival, many immigrants live in ethnic neighborhoods. They're called cohorts. Or, um, and what they're doing is, is a lot of times if they go to these major cities, uh, Toronto, Montreal, and British Columbia, sorry, Vancouver, is you, you move to the area where you will get the most support and most help. And that's often around the neighborhoods that are f of ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds the same as you. And this is both a strength and a weakness. Um, it inc you know, by being in these small groups and neighborhoods, you get limited access to the broader uh, community. Immigration can also mean um, be a means of separation from your family members. One, you have maybe a, you've moved over and you've brought your small children. As your children learn to grow up in Canadian society, the values between mom and dad become quite a bit different in some respects. And so this can be difficult, plus having some families living in the home country and you living in, con in this country. Female domestic workers often leave children uh, when they come to Canada on a temporary visa to care for Canadian children or seniors. And we noticed about two years ago that became a really uh, big news item around how many Canadians were taking advantage of foreign domestic workers. And then children of immigrants may have difficult time growing up with two cultures. And this is a difficult time for young people who are trying to fit into the culture that they're now living in, while at the same time trying to honor their family's background and cultural preferences. And it's a difficult transition for many children. Um, when we think about being different, there, uh, in theory, Canada uh, values acceptance and embraces this diversity, and yet in practice, not all groups feel this experience. Many of the first missionaries and government officials that saw Aboriginal customs saw it as being backwards, and they tried to wipe them out. They tried to change who they were. Um, residential schools became a very important element about that, and it had a profound impact on many, uh, many um, Aboriginal people. Um, so this is, and it's not just the Aboriginal people who have had this experience that um, most immigrants probably have had, and in fact, it's an immigrant who would best know what experience um, about being different in Canadian society is. Most Canadians would say that there isn't very much racism, but I think if you talk to people um, 
who themselves are of a uh, different background, different cultural background, we might hear something quite a bit different. So in terms of being different, stigma can be an attributed to, to what makes us different. It has a negative value that if I'm being broadly um, viewed as a uh, generalized perspective about my culture and I'm being tagged in that way in a negative way, that's called a stigma. Um, we have many elements about what we would call stigmas. Um, you know, these, since 9/11 and the the terrorist attacks, a lot of people of Muslim background or from the cultures of Iran and you know in Syria, uh, they get quickly stigmatized as being terrorists without really having any connection whatsoever. And is in much of Canada, the social acceptability is based on white, middle class, male norms. It's not as clear as that as it used to be. It's still um, where we're growing and we're seeing ourselves become more accepting. And yet, um, if you're in business, you probably recognize that in, you, you look at the color and the cultural backgrounds of our governments, both provincially, federally, and municipally and ask yourself, does it represent the population very well? If you look at the owners of big businesses, does it represent the population very well? And so it does exist. Uh, it may not be as overt as you might think, but it's still there. So the degree of stigma um, attached to a particular behavior or status sometimes changes with time. Um, I put the label jars, not people, um, image there because there was a time oh, about in the s late 70s and early 80s while I was working with the developmental handicapped population where the campaign by People First, that's a self-advocacy group by people with disabilities, was to label, pe label jars, not people. And I think what we've seen in many sort of subgroups and groups of different backgrounds is um, more acceptance for people for who they are and less identifying them by your by their differences um, and stigmatizing people I think it's made a I think there's a, a there is a, a change that has happened in many people's perspective about many different backgrounds the other image I put there is a single mom or it appears to be a single mom at one point the stigma attached to being a single mom was significant today it's not viewed as um, it, it nearly as badly as it was once. In fact, it might not be viewed as badly at all, in fact. So when we look at um, being different, there's four main or primary minority statuses. And when we look at minority, we look at groups that are less powerful, even though they may not be of less numbers. That there's a dominant group, a group that has control, if you will, and the minority group is the group that doesn't have that free control. And it's called aculturalization strategies. And we, we're, we're going to look at separation, assimilation, integration, and marginalization. So if we carry on with this being um, different, acceptable, we can look at the four major sort of subcategories. And one of them we look at is separation. And this could be either voluntary or involuntary. And this is where the dominant culture makes that decision oftentimes. It separates people in terms of their groups. Now this can be happening in history where this has happened with um, Japanese and Chinese immigrants that occurred back in the early 19th century. But this is also happens later and more currently where we saw it with um, many Muslims throughout North America, particularly after 9-11 and uh, September 11th of 2001. Now the second group is what's called assimilation. And with assimilation, it's based on the rejection of the heritage culture, and it's often been viewed as passing. And so passing would be the covering up or hiding of membership to a minority group. So someone from a different culture or ethnicity in particular might reject their own um, dress and, and mannerisms and adopt the one of which they've moved to. And it's voluntary and sometimes is forced based on culture or based on the place that they've moved to, but it's called assimilation. And so people from India that might reject some of their, his, their, their cultural heritage, particularly, for example, uh, the choice of marriage partners, and because of where they've moved to, they may start making their own choices. And that's uh, a form of assimilation. And then when we have integration, 
Uh, this is when there's high levels of engagement or high levels of both engagement of both heritage and mainstream culture. So there's a nice blending of the both. There's a marriage between the two, if you will. Um, most adaptive pathways, um, uh, because it implies bicultural competency, if someone's describing themselves as Polish Canadian or Italian Canadian, uh, we would call this, in a sense, it falls in the category of integration, where there's a marriage between the two, there's a blend of Canadian culture and Italian culture. And then the last one would be marginalization. And oftentimes, marginalization is um, um, the difficulty of maintaining a culture with little interest of having any relationship with the uh, others of the dominant culture. We often see people who are marginalized fitting into areas of delinquency and fitting into the areas of drug dependency. Um, there's not a lot of connection to a lot of other areas, and so they tend to be marginalized, pushed to the, pushed to the edges, if you will. Now, we have different policies in Canada, United States, and around the world regarding aculturalization. And these are the policies that either integrate or exclude immigrants. Um, and they're really sort of promoted by the dominant group. And they're seen through the laws and through policies of official programs. Now, I'm going to look at four of them. Multiculturalism. This is a policy that accepts diversity, and it includes all ethnic and cultural groups. Now, back in the late 60s, early 70s, I believe, I don't have it right at the tip of my fingers, um, Canada accepted as a part of who they were was going to be multiculturalism. And it began early, but it didn't become official, I think, I think until the late 70s, early 80s, I can't recall. So Canada is considered multiculturalist, which just means that we do accept the uniquenesses and diversities about people, and we include all ethnic and cultural groups. And that makes us unique in the world. Now, the U.S. is often known as the melting pot, where policies encourage that individuals assimilate into the dominant culture, which means, essentially, whatever cultural background you have, you push that aside and you demonstrate the uh, dominant culture's culture. You know, you believe what they believe, you dress as they believe, you talk as they talk, and that's part of what a melting pot is. So everything goes into a pot, get mixed together, and you become the sort of overall consistent and, and a similar package. Segregation would be policies that are based on forcing separation from the dominant group. And most cultures have had examples of segregation policies built into their history, if not into their current policy. And then exclusionary policies are ones that mar marginalize immigrants in particular. Now, if you're looking at this particular graph here, you're looking at aculturalization policies, and basically the dominant culture either accepts or rejects, and the minority culture either accepts or rejects. And it gives you some sort of, um, somewhat of a perspective about these policies and how they, you know, you can see that the dominant culture accepts multiculturalism, the minority culture accepts multiculturalism. Multiculturalism will likely be a best fit for all involved, and most people would feel very comfortable in that, as opposed to the minority culture is not going to like being excluded, and if the do dominant culture doesn't want to see people excluded, then it's not something that they will accept. It's something they will reject. Now, services for immigrants um, coming to Canada, as the website in the study guide that I showed you earlier, there's a big demand growing for services, and it's been a service that's been inconsistent in Canada because of the variation of immigration in terms of who's being um, accepted in, uh, where are the interests from around the world, and what services do they need. And so there's been a, um, a problem with people taking advantage of immigrants, taking their money, bringing them to Canada and then leaving them with no place to live and no job as was as was promised and Canada is trying to clean up that service and often out more. Uh, many immigrants choose to go to relatives or ethnic organizations for help because they feel comfortable with someone who looks like them and, and can speak their language. Um, many people come from cultures and countries where for example police aren't trustworthy so they come to Canada but it's hard to break 
habits of police being trustworthy as opposed to not trustworthy. When we look at the last piece about why is it important to be aware of these differences between families? Well, one of the key things is to be reminding of ourselves is that difference doesn't mean inferior. That difference uh, accentuates or enhances what family can be. That all individuals are shaped by the family and family and culture. And so all of that has a big positive effect potentially on family. It's a lot about our point of view and how we can view that experience. And the Canadian population is becoming more and more diverse. It's not getting less diverse. It's more what we call heterogeneous, not homogeneous. Heterogeneous meaning more diverse, more variation. Homogeneous meaning more alike and more the same. And we're all going to be affected by these changes um, resulting from uh, pressures for equal rights, which it sounds kind of a negative tone to be putting to pressures to equal rights, but equal rights is what we would want if we were in another culture and felt that as if we were being marginalized or somehow pushed to the side. We'd want to see equal uh, opportunities and equal rights. So uh, to be able to advocate for that and push for that and to see that as a part of who we are as a culture is powerful.